Welcome and good morning, everyone. I am Dennis Mitchell, Vice Provost for Faculty Advancement here at Columbia University. Uh, this event is part of a collaboration that began a year ago, back when we actually had meetings in person and in conference rooms. Uh, my team and I met with Stephanie Rowley, the Provost at Teachers College, Ariana Gonzalez Stokas, the Vice President for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at Barnard, and their colleagues to plan events to bring our faculty together and provide opportunities to share their expertise. One idea was a series of book club discussions that we would host by our respective campuses. Then of course COVID hit and everything changed. Then the racial unrest that was inflamed this spring and summer by the police murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and, and so many others. All of our plans seemed suddenly insignificant in comparison, and we could no longer continue our work as usual. Uh, we began to ask ourselves and each other, uh, you know, the really important question, what is the role of higher education in addressing systemic racism? Uh, and this summer, we held a panel discussion with that title, moderated by journalism professor June Cross. During that conversation, June recommended that we consider reading the book how the Irish became white. The book traces how Irish immigrants who fled persecution in their country achieved acceptance in the US in part by adopting the American culture of oppression of African Americans. Unfortunately, June cannot join us today due to an emergency, but we are joined for this discussion and pleased to be joined by interim provost Ira Katz Nelson the Ruggles Professor of Political Science and History, as well as Rebecca Cobrin, Russell and Bettina Knapp, Associate Professor of American Jewish History and the Director of the Institute for Jewish Studies, and Timothy Patrick McCarthy, Lecturer and Core Faculty at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard University. Thank you all for joining us today. We will begin with a panel discussion followed by a Q&A and then we will plan to have about 45 minutes of book club discussions in separate breakout rooms for faculty, students, and staff. The panel discussion will be recorded, but the breakout sessions will not be recorded. If you have questions, please post them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, and we will curate them to ask in the Q&A session. Our first question, which I would like to ask to Ira, then Rebecca and then Tim to address is how the Irish became white was originally published in 1995. What is it like to read the book now 25 years after its original publication? What is its relevance in light of recent events? Thank you so much. Warm thanks Dennis for your leadership and, and guidance, uh, especially at this uh, deeply uncertain time. Now, I've just reread this book uh, at this moment of uncertainty in the context of a quarter century since its publication of a widening continuum of possibilities in the United States concerning race and anti-Black racism. And by widening of possibilities, I don't mean only in a good direction, both good and bad. Uh, since 1995, just think of these markers. We've had Barack Obama elected twice as president of the United States with more white votes than John Kerry uh, achieved um, uh, four years before 2008. Um, and he's been followed by the most racist president since Woodrow Wilson. Um, we've had openings of once shut doors in core institutions like Columbia. Uh, this is my second time on the faculty. When I first joined as an assistant professor, my colleague Charles Hamilton was only the second tenured African American uh, on campus. Um, and in my own graduating class at Columbia College, uh, there were three African American uh, students. The doors were basically shut. Um, uh, and those doors uh, have opened, not as fully as they, as they should, but they're much uh, a big transformation, not just at Columbia, but in many uh, uh, institutions in American life. At the same time, we've experienced deepening isolation and segregation and brutal treatment for a large fraction of African Americans. 
On the good side, there's been, uh, even recently, popular rejection uh, across racial lines of brutal policing and the emergence of mass protests, primarily among younger adults, but together with emboldened and armed white supremacist groups. So since this book has been published, we've seen an a, a, a extraordinary widening for good and for ill of uh, the meaning and character of race and racism in America. So I reread um, uh, uh, how the Irish became white within this complex context. It is a blunt book. The downtrodden Irish, it argues, had choices about whether or not to identify with the even more downtrodden black population. They chose otherwise to be white and thus have joined and gained the reward of being on the white side of the black white binary. Explaining how a despised group of mostly destitute Catholic Irish newcomers became white, Noel Ignatiev wrote the following two key sentences. Quote, to enter the white race was a strategy to secure an advantage in a competitive Society. And in becoming white, the Irish ceased to be green. Now, these are very strong claims, and I believe they're not entirely correct. Um, they challenge us to ask how America's diverse ethnicity has collided with the binary of white and black, a system of unremitting oppression. How did newcomers with a status of not belonging come to get inside the game to enjoy white privilege. The book is powerful in part because it's simple and blunt, but the book's bluntness simplifies the historical record. And I believe against its own intentions, undercuts its view of race as a social construct and thus makes racial reconstruction a politics of overcoming not less difficult, but more difficult. Ignatiev infers a conscious strategy from the outcome, and he places most of the argument's causal weight on choices made by the Irish. Yet, as he writes in the afterward, he found no evidence in diaries, speeches, or other modes of representation that anti-Black Irish orientations were self-consciously strategic in exactly the manner he states. Yet that paucity of evidence does not mean that the Irish did not become white. I would craft the argument similarly but differently in three steps, and let me do this very briefly. One, the Irish did not self-consciously set out to be white. For them, white meant Protestant oppressors at their homes in Ireland and here in the United States, where they confronted fierce nativism and anti-Catholicism. Their goal was not to be white, for they understood their margin, was not to be white because they understood their marginality in America. But they did seek not to be black, not to be unfree, not to be in chains, not to be excluded from citizenship rights, including voting and military service, and not to be black in unofficial social standing. Second, the main driver of this ambition was not, though they existed, anti-Black Irish attitude, but the racial order they discovered in America. The Irish were white by definition. The Immigration Act of 1790 permitted free entry into America ex explicitly only of white people. And in America, Irish could vote, they could own land, they could serve in the military. They were not subordinated by law. In the main, I would argue, Racism was not so much a matter of Irish racism, if you like, was not so much a matter of Irish choice, but an unavoidable and official reality, buttressed by law and violence, official and unofficial. Third and last, in seeking standing in America as not black, the Irish did not stop being green by becoming white. What they wanted and achieved was to become Irish American, secure in a distinct identity and patterns of culture, while also being recognized as American. 
During the decades from the mid 19th to the early 20th century, when 5 million Irish arrived, they remained largely segregated in homes and jobs. They were understood to be culturally distinctive, many thought inferior. Supported, they supported Irish nationalist struggles against the British in the mother country, and they largely voted as a bloc. To be sure, they often were anti-Black, also anti-Jewish, jostling for jobs, private and public, in a world of ruthless ethnic and racial competition. They did not stop becoming green as they became white Americans. Finally, a reference to Michael Walzer's work called What Does It Mean to Be an American? Um, Walzer argued that whereas it has been impossible for Blacks to be African American in the same sense that Irish could be Irish American, that is, making voluntary choices about how thick or thin to make the Irish part of on, one, on the left of the hyphen or the American assimilated part on the right of the hyphen. Black Americans didn't have that choice, but it, the choice became possible for the Irish. Today, it is not impossible, but it's still achingly difficult for African Americans to make the choice that became available to the religious and ethnic minorities that arrived in America, especially in mass numbers after the 1880s. So the central question I draw from the book is this, what would it take for African-Americans to become African-American in the same sense that it became possible for the Irish to become Irish-American? where the degree of thickness of identities on both sides of the hyphen are not matters of choice imposed by legal, political, economic, and cultural powers that repress. This to me is the test of anti-racism, the quest to overcome white supremacy and white privilege. Um, can the Walzer model of what it means to be an American be available to African Americans the way it has been to white newcomers to the United States? The answer is not obvious. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to just start and I want to say I'm Rebecca Cobran, the Russell and Bettina Knapp Professor of American Jewish History. I want to thank uh, Dennis for this invitation. It's hard to follow Ira Katz Nelson who in many ways put forth one of the many main issues, but I wanna just say that from my first encounter with Dennis um, at the Office of Diversity, I thank Columbia for thinking of diversity in its many ways and the year 2020, as I always say to my kids, is historic, but particularly for those with uh, children at home, all going to school at home, the challenges will be remembered forever. And, I thank the Office of Diversity for recognizing what diversity is. So I want to talk about two things because I read this book my first year in graduate school when it first came out. And my advisor, Michael Katz, spoke about this issue of the author of Noel, of this combination of activism and the academy. So I want to, before I get to the book, think about what who the person is who wrote the book, know the historian to know the history and about what it means to combine a life of activism and the academy. So he uh, was an avowed communist from a communist Jewish family from Philadelphia. And he worked in factories for two decades before going and getting his graduate degree and then teaching at Harvard. And this is a quote from, quote, I was in the industry and in 30 Three years economy while pursuing my real career as a revolutionary. And I want us to think about, and I apologize if my internet uh, breaks up, is what it means for this Marxist radical and what he is trying in this book and the questions it raises about what I think and what I want to talk about is the central premise about race and racism as a construct. And this is from his afterward. He writes, the reader will note that I have written a book about racial oppression without using the term racism. I consider the term useless. 
And then he quotes Barbara Fields, who has informed so much of what I think of this. Uh, as Barbara Fields points out, it is applied um, to the view that one race is inferior to another, as well as the direct opposite, the view that members must be held down because they are superior. has been devalued to mean little more than personal preference for one complexion over another. That's what he argues. And I think when we're reading this 25 years later, I thought first of this understanding of what academics are doing and the role in activism, but more of what blossomed after this book is a whole field which became known as whiteness studies of thinking about the construction of what it means to be white in the United States, which has been um, critiqued and I agree with Ira's notion that it is a very blunt book, but I want us to be thinking about as we go forth the whole constructs and concepts of race, which are extremely useful and racism, but what they obscure and what they reveal and how they are used in this book and how they are used when we widely talk about um, different issues, both in society today and in the past. And I just want us to, the way I have read him, and I think that uh, Ira touched on this, the long history of, it's not just Jews, but Jews in leftist and left, in thinking about how race operates in the United States is a much larger topic. But this is a quote from what he wrote. And this is from uh, the end of the book. The greatest ideological barrier to the achievement of proletarian class consciousness, solidarity and political action and now is now and has been historically white chauvinism. White chauvinism is the ideological bulwark of the practice of white supremacy, the general oppression of blacks by whites. Indeed, I would argue that this book is trying to put forth slowly and methodically for the antebellum period, a period in which we have to understand slavery is still in existence as an institution in the United States and Irish are coming and, and becoming laborers. And most of the book, I'm gonna just say, this is part of my critique focuses pre um, the Emancipation Proclamation. And I think it's more interesting to be thinking about what happens in the late 19th and across the 20th century. And I hope that that's what we can think about. But in many ways for him, he is arguing, and I use Marx's term, that the opiate of the masses in the United States is race and white supremacy. And that is something I think that speaks directly to what we are seeing today. And thinking about this is his idea of how it obscures for people their common fate within, as a Marxist, in the capitalist system. So I think, his take on these very, very large issues by looking at the Irish is what is uh, interesting and exciting to be thinking about because the Irish, and I'm just gonna share my screen for two minutes because I think it's important to understand um, the different images used. He has some cartoons to describe this group and what that says about how the United States in which different constructions of different groups in racial terms have been used to both include and exclude them in the nation. And, and what that means, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna share my screen for one minute. So the questions I just wanna leave with is, I am more interested, the book focuses primarily up until the Civil War and then has one chapter that looks in the, in the immediate post-war reconstruction period. But for me, I'm most interested across the 20th century in which Irish are still being constructed in different ways. And this is from Harper's Weekly. All, all my cartoons or images come from Harper's. And what it says about the way in which Americans are um, visualizing difference and diversity. And this is what I love about um, book club for this, how diversity is imagined. So we see this, this is, um, as you know, it's all ethnic groups um, get applied to understanding how they look. And I think it's always, as he noted, in comparison, right, to African-Americans. And I just, I only have a few images, but I love this 
This image is from Harper's uh, Weekly, right? Thomas Nast, he's a very famous cartoonist from the late uh, 19th century. This is a, um, a depiction of what Irish look like when they celebrate Easter. It comes right after Easter. And it's supposed to be saying that they're rowdy and they get drunk in contrast, right, to the way Protestant America celebrates Easter. And I just want us to focus, right, on this person and this notion, and this is something for anyone who teaches uh, racism, Jewish history, anti-Semitism, the notion of dehumanization of people who are seen as being different for whatever reason that is. And the cartoon I think speaks volumes. And if we can go back to here, the notion of understanding physiognomy and what that means and seeing diversity of humanity in ways that really then get applied to so many different categories. So if I'm gonna leave with a question, I would say that does this book really achieve what he said by not using racism or race and make us question that category, which has been so central, both in the period that he's talking about, but I would say across the 20th century to how Americans understand their nation, divisions in their nation, and the world around them. That's one. And if he shows that we should throw this out, and then I'm going to be speaking about, and he, he says this, is that part of what he had intended in the book is to use the Irish as a way to have the academy address the failure, and this is a quote, to locate slavery and freedom in the proper place in the history of the American working class. And indeed thinking about a, the long, the long shadow cast by not dealing with understanding slavery and its relationship to developing economic systems, capitalism, we can say many things in the United States, what this book is arguing, what it achieves and what it doesn't achieve. And I, I end here and I look forward to our going on conversation. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Ira. Uh, it's hard to go after both of you now, uh, and Dennis too. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I will say, when I got the initial prompt about, you know, what does this book bring up? Reading it now, it brings up so many things. I actually first encountered Noel Ignatieff when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, um, where he was a very controversial member of the history and literature faculty. The department, the honors concentration that I was, uh, that I was in, uh, he was also controversial um, uh, politically, but also uh, because of a kosher toaster oven uh, controversy, which got him fired as a resident tutor in one of the houses at Harvard. So uh, I go way back. Noel was a reader of my thesis um, in undergrad, and he critiqued me quite uh, sharply. I'll try to be more generous to him today, uh, and then served on my orals, and then screamed at me and swore at me in the middle of my orals um, for not being radical enough in my readings of, uh, particularly in this case, Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. He would then later on apologize to me when I came back to Harvard to join the faculty in 1998 and said that he had been too harsh on me, but the reason was is that he had seen something in me that could become more radical, and that's why he went after me. So Noel and I have a, a very interesting history ourselves. I came to Columbia as a graduate student shortly before he published this book to study abolitionism and reconstruction with Eric Foner and Manny Marable. Uh, I worked at the Institute for Research in African American American studies where Manning became both a mentor and a father figure. Uh, and also at the time where Columbia was in many ways um, a, a leading force in the emergence of critical race theory and critical race studies, which is, I think, deeply interrelated to the emerging field of whiteness studies. And I think that's an important thing to, to think about is the ways in which these different fields, whiteness studies, critical race theory, African-American studies are all a labor theory, labor history and the new labor history. We're all really in conversation with each other, right? Not just through a Marxist lens, but through a black Marxist lens and other post-colonial theory and so forth. So this was a moment in the late eighties and 1990s and beyond where these emerging new fields that were really critically studying racial formation, uh, racial prejudice systems of oppression uh, were very much uh, interrelated. 
I also should say that the first course that I ever got to teach at Columbia with my dear friend and colleague Bob Hanning, who's now an emeritus professor, was a course called Representations, the Politics and Poetics of American Identity, where we talked about, uh, where we taught this book and also Matthew Fry Jacobson's Whiteness of a Different Color and several other uh, uh, studies, Barbara Jean Fields' famous essay on race, slavery, and ideology in the United States, which had a defining influence on me as a graduate student as well. Um, and we were, we were teaching this book. So I taught this book almost Almost as soon as it came out and almost as soon as I had read it right after my orals where I talked about it. So I have a long history that goes back to this. This is indeed a blunt book written by a blunt man. So uh, it literally is a manifestation of a particular kind of person, uh, an academic, intellectual, and activist as, as Rebecca noted. Um, let me just say a couple of things about what I think the book um, gets right. And I reread it and was struck by some things that I hadn't actually been struck by initially. Certainly the central contention that he makes um, that the white race consists of those who part, this is Ignatia, consists of those who partake of the privileges of the white skin in this society. It's most wretched members, again, the blunt language, share a status higher in certain respects than, the, than, than of the most exalted persons excluded from it. This book looks at how one group of people became white, Put another way, it asks how the I Catholic Irish, an oppressed race in Ireland, became part of an oppressing race in America. It is an attempt to reassess immigrant assimilation and formation or non-formation of an American working class. And so there you see the, the different types of, of, of discourses and intellectual traditions and interdisciplinary uh, concerns that Ignatiev has in a, as, as Ira said and Rebecca said as well, a, a, a kind of blunt or what uh, Richard Hofstadter that are once had a forceful overstatement, which is um, which is one characterization of this of this book. But the actual thesis that leads us to understand, among other works at the time, that race and whiteness are social constructions with no real legitimacy, no legitimacy at all, and biological. Uh, 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 or genetic kind of dispensation or orientation, I think is really important. This was one of the books that led, I think, the academy and the broader world to think about race as a social construction and as an ideology that Barbara Jean Fields talks about uh, in that essay. And so that, I think, remains an important advance. It wasn't the only book to do this, but it was among a field and an emerging uh, intellectual and political tradition that was self-styled and self identified as a political project as well as an intellectual project. And I think that's also really, really important. One thing that struck me in rereading it that I hadn't expected was the fact that this, in a sense, um, beckons um, a kind of Atlantic world or transnational history, that this is as much a history of the immigration of uh, Irish over time, increasingly Catholic, increasingly working class, uh, increasingly poor. Um, and, and that, to me, the, 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 the first chapter, which talks about Daniel O'Connor, Connell the repeal movement in Ireland and the abolitionist movement in Boston and Philadelphia and other parts of the United States, to me was actually a striking advance because it gestures at a larger transnational history, what we might call global history now, what we called then the Atlantic history of the Atlantic world. And I had forgotten that that was really how he begins the book. And I think it still in many ways is, is relevant of especially in a world where we have more migrants than ever before. We have refugee crises uh, caused by lots of different forces, but it seems to me that that piece of it uh, resonates today. Uh, it's certainly more for me than it did at the time. We also under, I think also what the book does is it, it really takes as its central uh, task the interrogation of dynamics of politics and dynamics of power. Of course, Noel himself was a self-identified revolutionary of, of various orientations and ideological positions and affiliations over his lifetime. But that idea of radicalism is at the core of this story. Right? The idea on the one part that Irish Americans were perhaps maybe anti-slavery by temper temperament given their lived experiences, but not abolitionist in their political affiliations because they understood that to be identified with a radical movement that sought to up revolutionize America was strategically a very bad mistake, whether or not it had to do with an affiliation or identification with whiteness or becoming white. And so I think there's a really interesting conversation that I think he could do a better job of amplifying and foregrounding. But this idea of the Irish, generally speaking, not, and it's all often 
often an overgeneralization, did not want to be identified with the most radical indigenous kinds of political movements in the United States, I think is worth thinking about as we try to be a little bit more nuanced and sophisticated about how we think about racial formation with respect to political ideology and political practices, uh, particularly as they result to abolitionism. One thing that also came up to me, and, and this was true of Noel generally, he's a race and class guy. Right, as so many people who were in this uh, work were doing. And he lacks an entire gender and sexuality lens, which becomes actually very important when he starts to talk only briefly about the emergence of the term mulatto in the, night, in the 1850 census. And this gets back to his critique of my senior thesis, was about, which was about interracialism and the construction and anxiety around mixed race characters in the early black novel in the 1850s and 1860s. He took me on for using the term mulatto, which he said only perpetuated a kind of white supremacy and racism. But he talks himself about the anxiety, the emergence of mulatto as a discourse and as a category in the 1850 census that then produced a whole bunch of cultural and political and social anxiety about the intermixing of so-called white people and so-called black people, most prominently between Irish women and black men in Northern cities where both groups were heavily concentrated. And so it seems to me that if we're going to talk talk about kind of the, the embrace of whiteness, we also have to talk about how the Irish are implicated in not only just interracialism generally, but interracial relationships, which were both social and sexual and at sometimes marital. So it seems to me that what's lacking here in its privileging of race and class is a kind of ignoring of gender and sexuality that I think could have been uh, quite useful at the time. Let me just close by saying that some of the critiques of the book, I think, still stand. One is that there's a kind of teleology here. My mentor and now friend Eric Foner says that historians always write with one eye on the past and one eye on the present. And that was definitely true of someone like Noel Ignatiev. And yet there seems to be a kind of teleology or inevitability that's driving this, which was true of a lot of Marxist interpretations, um, that, that, that this was an inevitable thing, that the Irish, of course, were going to become white because that's how you became American. And it seems to me that he takes that for granted and wants to tell a story that ultimately delivers that punchline or moral. And I think that he could complicate that teleology or resist it more than he does. I also think he could do, as some of my colleagues here have suggested, do more digging. And of course, there are over, always archival limitations. But the fact that he didn't do the digging and was selective in the evidence that he chose sort of in some ways robs the Irish of a certain kind of agency and voice in the own construction of their identity and affiliation. What does whiteness mean to the Irish? And what does whiteness mean to the Irish who are also still very much claiming an Irish identity that is in some cases still an old world identity and also a contemporary world identity caught up in the politics of Irish independence, the politics of Irish radicalism back in Ireland itself. So it seems to me that that's absent and that flies in the face of a claim that he's trying to restore agency to the Irish and he in, at the same time simultaneously in the teleolo teleology of whiteness uh, robs them of that agency itself. And then the last thing I want to say is, is something that makes it relevant to today that, the, that this is a book in a world where we're talking about anti-black racism and black lives matter and white supremacy culture and systems and systemic racism and systemic oppression. How does Noel Ignatiev's call to not use the term racism fit into this? How does Noel Ignatiev's call to dismantle and abolish, destroy the white race? He said in his journal, Race Trader, treason to whiteness is loyalty to humanity. If indeed the destruction of the white race and the abolition of whiteness brings about an eradication of the use of the term racism and of racial categories, what then does the day after the revolution mean and what does it bring in terms of the way we talk and the way we understand and apprehend the various histories that are intensely racialized and what does that mean for us in a world if we are both intellectuals and citizens and activists too which i consider myself to be what does that mean for the prospects of building a multiracial democracy which has always been eclipsed most dramatically at the fall of reconstruction for the 21st century in the wake of trump he himself said, this book raises more questions than answers. And I think the questions that he raises and the questions his book energizes actually are more relevant today in some cases than the answers that he offered.
Thank you to all of the panelists for your reflections, just outstanding. Um, and I want to remind all of those in attendance, to please uh, post any of your questions in the Q&A for us. Uh, while we're here in the Q&A, I'd like to give the panelists an opportunity to reflect on each other. Uh, I thought that uh, points raised by all of you were, were um, had me thinking quite a bit. So I would love to hear your individual thoughts of any of the other panelists and what they've had to say today as we await other questions from the audience. Um, I, I was struck by one more word that's mostly absent, um, a, a word that a concept that was invented in the early 20th century to designate uh, persons like the Irish, like Southern Italians who came to America, like the Jews who came from East and Central Europe, the, the term ethnicity, um, which was meant to designate difference in the, in, the, in the kind of liminal in-between zone between white and black. That is, it was not possible to simply reduce um, uh, a Neapolitan newcomer or a Sicilian peasant uh, to the category white um, uh, as if um, that person or those persons were identical somehow uh, categorically and substantively to um, uh, the great majority of Americans at the time. Um, uh, and uh, it seems to me that one of the challenges of this book, um, conceptually and politically, um, is to think about the relationship between the complexity of ethnicity and the simplicity, the willful simplicity of uh, anti-Black racism and the divide between white and Black. Um, and the, the, the challenge of the book, not the answer so much, but the profound challenge of the book is to ask us as, as both um, uh, uh, Tim and Re uh, Rebecca, each in their own way, emphasize the complexity of the relationship um, between um, uh, the, the, the highly um, uh, rigid, simplified history of the racial divide um, and the, you know, you were black or white. Um, uh, you might get the pass, but you're still black if you're found out, as it were. Um, uh, and that the rigidity of that line, in, instantiated in law and in violence um, and in policing of various kinds, and the complexity of belonging for the new, the newcomers. Um, who weren't simply white, but also certainly were also not black. That seems to me to be a great challenge. Um, and as I ended my remarks, uh, the challenge of the meaning of the, the shift of terminology toward African Americans signified in part, and Jesse Jackson often made this point, the, the wish for blackness to also become an ethnic and not just a racial identity. With, with pride and origins, um, with acknowledgement of Africa as, as home and as um, uh, the American, African-American community as diasporic in the same sense that the Irish had a diaspora, uh, the Italians had a diaspora, and the Jews had a diaspora. So I was challenged by your remarks to think hard about those questions um, uh, and thank you for that. Can I, I just want to respond to what Ira and just add something and, and seeing the question. You know, I think that one of the shortcomings and uh, Tim mentioned this, there's a very teleological and I'm going to say this black and white Marxist vision of this book and how the argument is constructed. And I would say that um, when I actually teach it, I think where the field has moved it, is that it, it is too uh, black and white and understanding race and understanding the complexity of what, what Ira was saying about ethnicity, but how many, many different groups, right? This is a story of how the Irish become quote, right, white, but is it similar for Germans, Poles, Italians, or how is it different? 
or is it the same? And then I wanna just say Asian Americans, and this is why I, I focused on the post uh, Civil War period is that it is not only about understanding how African Americans are discriminated against on many levels, but also how federal legislation constructs and then discriminates against Asian Americans. So I think that that if we want to use this book to raise larger questions, is that's thinking about what he puts forth and his arguments, but then thinking about how more complex it is and some of the more recent literature takes on that complexity. I would just to pick up on, on this conversation, um, I too think that there, as I said, you know, anytime there's a blunt book by a blunt person, there's room for nuance and complexity. But I also think that one of the things, the, some of the bluntness is actually, I think, helpful, right? And the way that, and, I mean, Nell Painter and her History of White People, which is brilliant too, highly recommended, and I often will teach this and that together. Uh, you mentioned before what other kinds of things might you pair with it, that's one, um, is, you know, talks about, you know, that whiteness, right? or that white identity is in a sense not so much about whiteness or fair skin or phenotypical or physiological dimensions but it's 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 an attempt to articulate a social identity and privilege and practice that's not black explicitly within an american context of anti-blackness um and and that is blunt right the by the racial binary of that are there are only white people and black people right does exclude and and downplay or elide a lot of the distinctions and nuances and complexities we're calling for but it also points to something that not i think does well is that whiteness is used as a cudgel right whiteness is used as a tool he says that it's not that that white privilege is not just um you know it's not just the ideological bulwark or or of the practice of white supremacy it's the tool with which in his case the bosses or the master class or whatever category you use for the people in power to divide and conquer right to not just oppress black people, but to use whiteness as a way to divide and conquer. And so people who can claim whiteness, right, do as a, as a, as a form of, as what Du Bois said, as a wage or a, a form of property, right, of some kind of privilege, even if that doesn't mean that they're going to be the bosses or the master class themselves, right, within a capitalist system or even a kind of a system of racial supremacy, um, but that they get closer to it, or at least they get further enough away right, from the people they're defining themselves against. And that sometimes that doesn't have nuance at all, that the use of whiteness as a kind of tool to divide and conquer, um, which Nolanatiev would articulate as a kind of um, a way to, to undermine the possibility of revolution in a kind of Marxist sense or, or anti-capitalist sense, um, is really on the table here. And I think that as we search, as scholars do, for the complexities and nuances of ethnic formation and racial formation and the history of group uh, identity and, and so forth and immigration and so forth, that we not lose track of the, uh, lose sight of the fact that, that race has always been used as a blunt instrument to divide and oppress. Just fascinating. Oh, I, I see you uh, with, go, go right ahead. Two very quick points. Um, I, I, these terrific comments of my colleagues. Um, I would say first that um, uh, the Second World War um, and the suburbanization that followed the war transformed the meaning of ethnicity and whiteness um, and uh, created as the work of, among others, Gary Gerstle showed uh, in his study of, uh, of Rhode Island um, and many others that um, uh, as the situation altered, um, uh, the, the dynamics of a group identity and the construction of identity was transformed. Having said that, I want to underscore um, very positively and sympathetically um, the way in which the literature of whiteness um, of the 1990s, of which this book was critical. Think of the work of David Rodiger, Alexander Saxon. Um, they brought race directly into studies from which race had been absent. Labor studies, working class formation studies um, had proceeded as if the racial divide in America had nothing to do with them. And this book, this kind of in your face book, um, the power of in your face sometimes is, is spectacular because it forced the development of subsequent intellectual complexities 
could not ignore what had been ignored for many decades in the academy, whereas the studies of race was seen as somehow separate from, rather than an integral part of not only labor studies, but the studies more broadly of American political development. Um, so for that, a great favor was, was done by Ignatiev, by Rodiger, by Saxon and others, notwithstanding any shortcomings that some of us think exist. Can I, can I just add one quick thing? Um, I also think that's very true, and I, I, I'm glad you named Chuck those folks. I also think it's really important to understand that Rodiger and Ignatiev and Saxton and, and folks, Theodore Allen, many folks um, have, are, are explicitly indebted, not just to, to black academics and intellectuals who come out of an African-American studies tradition or what Manny Marable always called black studies tradition or black freedom struggle. It also is indebted to the white authors and activists who came before like James Baldwin and Toni Morrison and James Weldon Johnson and uh, uh, um, uh, David Walker, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, so many people over time, uh, right? I mean, it, James Weldon Johnson in, in the autobiography of an ex-colored man, which I wrote an essay on in graduate school uh, and taught in, in my representation seminar with Bob Hanning, he said that you know, black people know more about white people than white people know about themselves. Right, and part of the undoing of the system is to is to is to get rid of your miseducation, right? And and Baldwin talked about how 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 black people have operated as a fixed star, and when they move out of place, right, the whole worldview and imagination of white people gets torn asunder, right? David Walker talked about, you know, he 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 went right at a critique of Thomas Jefferson that just eviscerated Jefferson's white supremacy and racism. So I think it's important when we talk about whiteness studies scholars, many of whom are white. Right, and, and come out of a Marxist tradition, many of them are white men who come out of a Marxist tradition that we not lose sight of the fact that they are deeply indebted, always were and still are to the field of critical race theory of African-American studies and of a long black freedom struggle um, that has in, in, in its sense illuminated whiteness and white people and white supremacy and white racial categories more than white people or whiteness studies people could ever do. <laughs> just wanted to say that. Hi. Um, I'm just, uh, I just want to do one final thing and just to note, and I'm going to now call out also Ira Katz Nelson, who I read in my first semester of graduate school, the issue of politics, because I want to relate it to the moment. And I think Noel's treatment of Tammany Hall really was excellent in understanding how political machines work in this entire system of constructing a new identity for the Irish and Ira Katz Nelson's City Trenches, I read two weeks after that and thinking, I mean, he deals with New York, but in the moment that we're dealing with, thinking how politics, politicians, political machines, how they work and how they are part of understanding this larger story. So I just wanted to say that I think that is one of the strong parts of the book. Just a fascinating, fascinating back and forth and discussion from you all panelists and I'm incredibly grateful. Clearly, this is a conversation and discussion that needs to continue. It, uh, it will in many formats. I think that we will try to transition now to the individual work groups uh, so that we can have those converse, additional conversations, but we're expecting all of you in the audience uh, uh, scholars in particular and students especially to uh, continue this conversation outside of uh, today. Um, it's, it's, it's clear that this is a, a, a book that uh, extends well beyond 1995. I'm going to introduce you now to uh, a team member of, of mine, Adina Brooks, who will just go through the logistics and, and navigate us to our next uh, workroom. Thank you, and uh, thank you to all the panelists um, for your amazing contributions today. So in the chat, there are already links to the three breakout rooms. Um, there'll be different Zoom meetings, one for faculty, one for staff, and one for student. They're up on the screen as well, um, but they are easily found in the chat, so you can link right to them if you haven't already registered. In about two minutes, we're going to hop over there um, and uh, talk more and continue this conversation um, as students, as staff, and as faculty. But um, in the meantime,